Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ofer Harduf. I'm a partner uh, here at Fifth Wall. I help manage our relationships uh, with our many strategic partners, and we're very lucky to have four of them uh, on the stage with us here today. Uh, the topic of the conversation is how those organizations, and we'll talk about their backgrounds in a second, have thought about uh, implementing sustainability and technology initiatives into their organizations. Uh, we have a very, very diverse group of, uh, of folks here, uh, but there's one thing in common for all of them is they all spent a tremendous amount of time thinking about sustainability and uh, technology, and we're very lucky to, to be working with them very closely. Uh, so I'll start by introducing uh, the members here. So on uh, my right, uh, Jason Risordo. Uh, he is the former director of Durst Ventures and Real Estate Transactions for the Durst Organization, where he is joining us midway as he relocates to Sydney, Australia. Uh, the Durst Organization focuses on large-scale sustainable development in this port portfolio of 13 million square foot of office space and 3,500 residential units is based in New York City. They own recognizable buildings like One Bryant Park, uh, North America's first lead platinum tower. Um, to his right, Anthony Patnud, um, he has been a portfolio manager, real estate with Alberta Investment Management Corporation, or ANCO, since November of 2018. Anthony is focused on the US market with an active role in sustainability, as well as PropTech initiatives. ANCO manages 158 Canadian billion uh, dollars on behalf of nearly 30 pension and endowment funds. Um, Jeff Karen uh, oversees the investment practice at Osgood Properties. Osgood Properties is an owner operator of multi family real estate with a family office that includes land, venture capital, as well as traditional equity investments. And then, last uh, but not least, Andrew uh, Andre Brook uh, is an innovation manager based in California at Goldbeck. Uh, a family-owned European general contractor with $6 billion uh, in revenue. For six decades, Goldbeck's used industrial construction and prefabrication to deliver commercial real estate to its clients, which include Prologis, Amazon, Tesla, whose uh, gigafactory Berlin, Goldbeck, built. Um, okay, so I want to start um, with just a basic question, just to kind of set the stage. As I said, you're all... Uh, spend a lot of time thinking about sustainability and developing a strategy to implement uh, technology and innovation into your organizations. I'll start with you, um, Anthony. Um, obviously, you're one of the largest uh, owners of real estate in North America. How has AIMCO thought about uh, their sustainability initiatives? Well, we, we want to take an active role in sustainability, we want to make sure that we are reviewing all the opportunities that we can. We work with a number of different partners, uh, a number of uh, different managers. So we have a lot of opportunity to work in different asset classes with different groups. And it brings, uh, it brings a really good sort of group collective of information together. Uh, we're investing in it for, for obvious reasons. We, we believe that climate risk is real. Whether you believe in climate change or not is relevant. The, the risks associated are monetary. In Canada, we have a price of carbon. It's a fact. It's coming to the United States. I'm, I'm fairly certain of that. It might not be this administra administration or the next, but it's, it's coming. So the, the financial risk is real, the, uh, which, which creates transitional risk. Uh, from a physical standpoint, it's, uh, it's something that's in our backyard. Alberta, if you're familiar with Canada, we, uh, you know, for we were on calls while there were massive, massive fires burning 50 miles away. In 2013, downtown Calgary was flooded out. Resiliency risk is real. You, you have to deal with these things, whether you like it or not. And the financial part of it is just an added incentive. So it's very important to us to make sure that we are, we're looking at it from a very holistic standpoint, but it, obviously has to make financial sense first and foremost. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Follow-up question um, on that. Uh, you know, the one thing that's obviously unique about you, you can make decisions on, on what technology or what initiatives you would like to implement across your portfolio, but you have a lot of partners. You have you know, uh, managers uh, that you have to work with. Uh, you have jo joint venture partners. You're not the sole decision maker, and I think it's important to distinguish between somebody who's vertically integrated and can make all the decisions on their own 
Um, how do you navigate this um, kind of landscape once you made a decision to implement a you know, certain sustainability or technology initiative? Well, I think it really sharpens our decision making because we have to be so disciplined. We, uh, we, we invest on behalf of almost 30 pension funds and endowment funds, one of the largest of which is an endowment fund that was created through carbon revenues in Alberta. We are a carbon-based economy in our province and uh, we have to give a lot of consideration to differing viewpoints and, and to your point about having so many joint venture partners, we, we can't act in isolation. We have to take into account everybody's interests and, and I think that really helps us make good decisions. Great. Um, Jason, similar question to you. Um, obviously, you're one of the largest um, owners and operators of real estate in, uh, in New York City, which is obviously a very, very dynamic uh, real estate market, but also a very uh, dynamic sustainability um, market. Um, how does the Durst organization uh, develop their sustainability uh, initiatives? Yeah, so we focus on it from two perspectives, both as an end user and an investor. So we really believe that investing in resources related to innovation and climate solutions makes a lot of sense for us, and that's both in terms of capital and personnel. Um, we view that this will ultimately lead us to a position in which we're able to provide an elevated level of service to both our residents and tenants over the long-term perspective. Um, as a vertically integrated developer, we have it somewhat easier that we don't have to really deal with joint venture partners nearly as much. Um, so this allows the ventures team to work pretty collaboratively directly with our ownership and department heads on key decision making processes. Um, ultimately as well, you know, when we got started, we really leveraged our internal resources like our sustainability department, our engineering teams. Um, our project developments and our operations teams. And when we were getting started, we, you know, we met with these groups and we tried to identify what are some of the biggest problems that they need help in addressing. And this was a pretty exhaustive list. It included things like energy efficiency, energy storage, um, water treatment, indoor air quality, construction materials, automation, robotics, material stream optimization. So we had a lot of work to do. Um, but thankfully, from our investment perspective, we were pretty nimble. So we've invested from Series C through Series D and even into some public equities. Um, but ultimately, you know, once this process was established, we were then able to take that, um, hit a few base hit wins, I would say, and then really gain buy-in from the rest of the company in terms of scaling our um, venture portfolio quite significantly over a 20-year period. Um, and the ideal way that we viewed of doing that was ultimately signing up as a customer first and really using that as our due diligence process and then following on as an investor. Um, and we benefited significantly from our partners like Fifth Wall in terms of helping us find innovative solutions and also you know, even working collaboratively with us in terms of due diligence processes. Um, this really opened up the door for us and allowed us to scale. Um, you know, taking a step back, our company's core values include things like being innovative, but key, one key one is having a long-term perspective. And this allowed us both from a development and a venture perspective to take, you know, an iterative approach to innovation. So we're not going directly from zero to 100. You know, we're, we're starting off on a small scale. We're trying things out. We're improving it. We're scaling it. If it works, we'll continue to use it. Um, but at the same time, we, we recognize that this is going to be a challenging problem, um, particularly as it relates to construction materials. Um, so yeah, that's kind of been our general approach in getting started. And, and I, think, I think this is very, very unique, that approach that you just mentioned, this kind of forever owner um, you know, kind of mentality that you guys have. Because I think sometimes you know, the horizon, uh, the investment horizon is what um, you know, prevents organizations from making the right investments, which are the right long-term investments for assets, but obviously it's very different for you, just given uh, how you treat your, your assets. Um, let me turn it over to, um, to Andre um, and, and, and Jeff and talk a little bit about your respective industries. Uh, you represent two very large uh, real estate asset classes. Uh, the first one is obviously construction um, with Andre and then uh, multifamily with, uh, with Jeff. Um, just very, uh, very curious to hear kind of your different perspectives on 
um, your industries, where do you see need for innovation right now? What excites you the most today? Obviously, we work very closely together, and there's a long list of topics we're um, focused on, but um, I'll start with you, Andre. Construction technology, I'm not sure there's anybody in a better position to kind of talk about uh, construction technology innovation. What's exciting for you right now? Yeah, thanks. Um, so first of all, we as a general contractor, so go back, we don't only do the construction, we also operate and own partially um, the buildings that we built. So we took a look at the operations fans and obviously 60% of the, of the uh, emissions are within these operations. That being said, um, you take the escalator, go down to RE Plus and you find tons of solutions. So we have the technical solutions. We talked about embodied carbon, I don't know if Cody's here. Um, that's one solution for embodied carbon and circular economy for the whole life cycle of a building, but there are very few of these solutions. So um, Greg actually asked for a call to action. Greg, whenever you're there, um, please find more like uh, solutions that help us to kind of like know what is in the building. What do we do in 40 years with, uh, with a concrete, with, with a drywall? We just don't know what we're doing. If we have, uh, for example, a digital building pass, like a digital twin with all the data um, like EBDs on every single uh, product. We have after that 40 years to decide what are we doing afterwards. But right now we just don't know what is in our building. And if we think about circular economy and about uh, recycling, what will happen? We tear down the building with a big wrecking ball. Um, maybe <laughs> we recycle steel and concrete and everything else is burned. And that's not the solution. And I think, for example, um, this building passes also um, the basis on everything what follows up. So for example, we have a pilot project with Siemens. We are just currently um, building their uh, headquarter in Germany. And we not only committed on a fixed price, on a fixed handover date, but on a fixed amount of embodied carbon. This is the first thing we ever did. I think it's the first contract that is out there that is like that. And this is a big commitment from Siemens, but also a big commitment from us. And uh, yeah, so maybe this excites me also the most. Thanks, Very Andre. Interesting. Um, from my perspective, in terms of excitement, I'd say broadly when it comes to prop tech, I think one of the things that's been exciting is the extent at which, so uh, like the size of problems that are getting solved. I think if I rewind four or five years ago, there were a lot of point source solutions specifically focused on certain pain points, like. I don't know, in the world of you know, leasing for us, we would have someone come in and pitch us on optimizing marketing spend or, or figuring out how to syndicate our, our ILS listings. And now you've got companies that can actually help you solve the entire lead to lease process. And then when we look at climate tech and where I think innovation needs to go is, is that same place, solving that bigger problem and doing it more holistically. Today we've started to see some of these kind of gen two hardware solutions whether it's like variable frequency drives uh, from some, a company like Turntide or just smart systems. Um, and where I think the opportunity is, you, know, you mentioned digital twins, the ability to integrate these smart systems more broadly together to provide a much more complete solution where you really kind of emphasize that kind of triple bottom line where you get savings as a building owner, you get lower greenhouse gas emissions, and then finally a better experience for your tenant um, and overall better comfort for them as well. Great, thank you. Um, Andre, going back um, to you, um, let's talk a little bit more about real world examples. I love that, that Siemens um, example you just gave us, very, very um, unique. Um, can you give us um, some examples? Obviously, I know that uh, you have a full team dedicated to um, to research uh, new technologies, uh, the space here in California. Um, what are some of the examples you can give as it relates to uh, specific companies or technologies uh, that you've implemented successfully uh, at Goldbeck that helped you achieve your either sustainability goals or efficiency goals? Um, I give you two, I both about concrete because I love concrete. Um, first one is a self-development we did with our research team in uh, Germany. Second one is a, is a startup from Germany. Start with the second one uh, called Sonocrete, may or may know. Um, they actually invented a reactor that stands in the concrete factory and you put your mix within the that you use for the, your components in this reactor 
and uh, they treat it or they treat this mix with a high performance ultrasound. And by that, they increase the early strength of, um, of the concrete, and we can just get it out of the framework earlier. By that, we were able to decrease uh, the cement within our mixes by 30%. And the very cool thing is, and I think you mentioned it, uh, is this reactor costs about uh, $100,000 per, uh, per unit. It's nothing. This is nothing comparably to 30% decreasing of cement. So now uh, we implemented one, we have seven other factories to come, and we see this as a kind of an investment in our corporate real estate. So by the end, um, our client does not pay a premium, green premium, or whatever. We just be able to have the same price for our component with 30% less cement. Um, that was the first one. Second one, um, we build about 100 car parks every year uh, with 30 to 40,000 um, um, car parks. Like 100 car parks with 30 to 40,000 car parks itself. Um, it's basically a steel, super steel superstructure with concrete slabs. And these concrete slabs have, usually have um, steel reinforcement. And we are working since a couple of time with, um, to implement a carbon fiber reinforcement. And we just finished the first car park that we have for our own company, like next to our headquarters, with carbon fiber uh, reinforcement. And by that, we were able to decrease the thickness of a slab from eight to six centimeters. For you guys that are not in metrics, it's 2.3 inches, what is like this, for car parks. And we can scale it up to 30, 40,000 car parks, so units that we built. So these are two things that we implemented. Um, we are working on different stuff, like carbon capturing and storage is a big thing, but that will need like a couple of years. Um, we look at uh, the, the guys from Brimstone, of course, and we are very sure that we can um, or we are able to hit the net zero for cement and concrete by the end of this decade. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. Um, Jason, um, over to you. So I think what's, what's unique about you, we, I think one of the things that allowed Andre to do all the things that he just said was uh, scale, right? They're one of the largest um, general contractors in, um, in Europe. So think about um, you know, New York City, obviously you guys are one of the largest real estate owners, operators there. Uh, can you give us some examples as well um, that relate to some specific companies, technology that you implemented? And, and uh, the other thing that's unique about you, you're also an investor sometimes in, in those startups, right? So you, uh, you lead a team that, that also focuses on underwriting those businesses and potentially investing in them directly. So we'd love to get your take, maybe one or two examples. Yeah, of course. Um, I guess I'll stick with um, concrete um, since it was brought up already. Uh, but one of the companies that we've been working with is a production of ground glass porcelain, which is post-consumer recycled glass. Uh, the name of this company is Urban Mining. Um, and we've used this in three projects uh, dating back to 2016. Um, we like it because it's a lower carbon um, output than cement. And we really just started off on a small scale. At first, our second project still a relatively small scale. We did one small retail slab pour. Um, but now our, our current multifamily development project, 40% of our superstructure and foundation is utilizing this GGP mix. Um, and to, for full transparency, dealing with materials has been tough. Um, it doesn't always go as you predict. Um, and it definitely requires a lot of hand-holding along the way. Um, but why do we do it? For a few reasons, um, one of which being uh, prevents the use of fly ash within cement, um, which ultimately just continues to perpetuate the coal industry. Um, another is through some testings, we were able to find out that this alternative um, cement um, contributed 51% of less global warming potential. Um, so those are things that are important to us as a developer that's keenly focused on our carbon footprint and our sustainability. Um, and ultimately, you know, this is a process that involves a lot of parties. So um, we have our ownership, we have general contractors, we have subcontractors, we work with structural engineers and the cement producers or concrete producers as well. And this is something that's complex. It requires a lot of buy-in. 
And it's a little bit challenging. Um, and these people really need to bring their A game if we're going to use these new type of materials on our buildings. Um, so one thing that we do to try to kind of prevent these problems from happening is we host offsites on the kickoffs of any of our projects where we kind of invite all the stakeholders within the same room. We work on alignment of goals, try to problem solve in advance. Now for full transparency, there's always problems on the job site still. Um, these include things like, you know, working with variations in terms of temperature and conditions on site. Um, this also includes just struggle with auditing, making sure you're actually getting what you're paying for. And then also, you know, particularly for superstructure, it's important for us to monitor the mix strength. Um, so these types of additional checks and balances that we need to go through as part of this process can ultimately impact our schedule and our pours. So it's something that we're extremely mindful of and it's been challenging to work through. Um, but ultimately, you know, hearing other panelists up here talking about uh, concrete's impact from a carbon perspective, we think that these challenges, although they're very hard and, you know, have required this iterative process for us to get comfortable with using it, it's ultimately worth it in the long run. So you talked about some of the challenges in implementing new technologies. And the one thing that we haven't talked about a lot today is um, obviously we're operating in a very different macro environment than we did in the past decade or even more than that. That relates to just cost of capital, right? Uh, we talked about some of the incentives potentially here, but um, obviously we can't ignore the elephant in the room, which is, um, you know, interest rates and, and cost of capital has, has gone up dramatically uh, in the past, you know, two years. Um, my question is um, to you, Anthony and, and, and Jeff, as um, capital allocators to the space, um, how has that impacted your decision um, making you know, in this environment, just given the fact that every dollar you spend has to have now perhaps better or higher ROI? I'll start with you maybe, Anthony. Sure, so, so it's fairly intuitive how it's impacted the decision making model. The, the fact of the matter is, is that my fiduciary duty is to my investors first and foremost. So uh, I've got to make the best financial decision I can. Anytime there's incentives involved, it's going to, it's going to create a business case for better efficiency, for carbon reduction. And, and so that's something that excites me. We're talking about things that excite us, but the fact that I can actually uh, have an impact on our carbon, uh, our, our, our carbon emissions while still maintaining a good business case is, is really critical. Again, I go back to the price of carbon in Canada. It's, it's, it's been a game changer. We don't have the IRA in Canada. Uh, it would be wonderful if we had something even remotely close, but in the US, there's no doubt that it's impacting the way we're looking at everything from building system replacements, HVAC replacements, to how we build, how we, what materials we use in construction. So there's no doubt that those programs are having a, a positive impact on carbon reduction because at the end of the day, they're becoming much more cost neutral for us. Yeah, and interestingly, so we're family owned and operated and don't have the same necessarily fiduciary duty, but we have a lot of the same incentives. And what's interesting is when we look at projects, we just look at, at the microeconomic level. So specifically at the project level and think of two key questions. One is, what's the incremental cost and uh, corresponding benefit for doing some sort of carbon reduction measure? And two, what is the cost to abate that carbon on a marginal basis? So when you think of question one, you just look at a like for like replacement of an asset versus some sort of lower carbon alternative. So let's take windows, for example. Um, I could, you know, window comes up to the end of life and I have to replace it. I could just do it with a standard Energy Star window or I could look at something like uh, these new kind of thin triple plane windows. And with some of the incentives around energy performance standards, those things are only 20% more expensive on a capital basis, but drive three to 4% cost savings over the entire building. That ends up being like a five to seven year payback. So all of a sudden, even in seven, 8% interest rate environments, I'm, I'm generating a pretty good spread over that cost of capital. Um, and then to answer question two, we're in Canada as well. So we have a cost of carbon to deal with. And so any project that has a lower marginal cost than the cost of uh, carbon today makes sense. And not only that, so it's in Canada, the cost of carbon is $65 today. It's going up to $170 in seven years. And if we don't do anything as an owner, 
our uh, operating costs from a utility standpoint go up 50%. So we're now incented to act even in this environment uh, from an interest rate perspective. Um, that's very interesting. Switching uh, gears um, for a second here, talking a little bit, I know you mentioned this a little bit, Jason, some of the, um, some of the challenges perhaps uh, with implementing kind of new technologies. I would love to get um, your take, uh, the other panelists as well. Um, as you think about, and obviously we at Fifth Wall throw a lot of different ideas and companies um, your way. Um, obviously, you, you talk to a lot of startups, many of them are in the room here uh, today. Um, kind of any lessons learned or any kind of things that you can share with some of those um, you know, founders or owners as to how to engage with your organizations or think about a solution that's going to be um, you know, useful for you as owners, operators, investors, you're all wearing kind of different hats. Um, just an open question for, for all of you guys. Should I start? Yeah. Go for it. Um, maybe the biggest lessons learned comes from the project with Siemens is commitment. Uh, commitment from everybody that is involved, like real estate developers, uh, the general contractors, but also the trades. And the trades, I think, um, is the most um, or is the field where we have the biggest hurdles. Um, even though if we have like governmental regulatories, for example, there's a word in Germany, it's called uh, Lieferketten Sorgfaltspflicht. It's as hard Can as Can you say that again, sir? <laughs> Lieferketten Sorgfaltspflicht. Got it. Yeah. So um, we as a general contractor, we are basically um, responsible for everything what happens within the supply chain of the, of the trade. So where is he buying his steel? Where is he buying his um, drywall? Blah, 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 blah. Impossible. Just impossible. So we need them. We need the suppliers. And this is maybe my state. Um, commit and get it all together. Yeah, interesting you talk about trades because one of the things that we're starting to think about is as you know, things like local law 97 come, as the cost of, of carbon increases, the demand for these solutions is only going to go up. And there aren't that many skilled trades to solve these problems and actually install these systems. And so we're actually spending a lot of time and effort internally to educate our own staff because we know that there's going to be a shortage of knowledgeable people to actually implement solutions. So, so I'll give the perspective from sort of the top-down capital. Obviously, I'm not dealing directly with the trades, and, and so it's not a big, a big a, an issue for me, but what is an issue uh, is twofold. And I actually had this conversation today with, uh, with somebody we've spoken with. First of all, I need to be able to communicate with my, with my stakeholders. I need to be able to communicate with the pension funds, the, the endowment funds, and show them what we're doing in a way that's digestible. So they're not interested in seeing a super te technical readout. They don't, they don't want to try and process a lot of data. They want to see a nice dashboard. And I need to be able to slice and dice that. I need to be able to break it down based on dollars spent, carbon reduction uh, in Canada, and US, Europe, between asset classes, office, multifamily, industrial, whatever the case may be. But I need a forward-facing interface that helps me prove out the technology so that I get buy-in. On the back end, I come from a background of, of building operation and asset management. And, and so intuitively, I speak building engineer, building operator. And so I'll, I'll walk into my assets where we're maybe piloting some technology. And right away, I can tell by the reaction that I get from those guys whether this technology is something that's working at the asset level. So if they're pulling their hair out because this technology is driving them crazy, we're, we're less likely to continue with the pilot. Uh, but if they're turning around and saying, wow, this is making my life easier, this is making it easier for me to achieve the goals that we're all trying to work towards, then we've got a winner. So if you can, if you can help me communicate with my clients and you can help keep the building operations happy and, and uh, more efficient, then you've got a winner. Yeah, and just chiming in quickly as well. Um, I think owners should ultimately be mindful that if you're trying new things and you know, really being an early adapter, things aren't going to be that easy. And you need to kind of go into these projects with that type of mindset that you're going to have problems that you need to work through. And I think, you know, having benefited from working with a vertically integrated company, we're able to pull in various subject matter experts. And this is really where, you know, if our team's helping a company with R&D and a go-to-market strategy, then, you know, our investment arm, it makes a lot of sense for us to participate 
in that upside, so we're able to get benefit on the equity side or through warrants or some other um, type of incentive that you know our team is helping this company go to market, whether it's through R&D or through um, pilot programs and really giving them an opportunity to try new things um, on a large scale. I think that that's you know, a way that we could help. That's great. Okay, um, we only have a couple minutes left. Um, I wanna mention uh, four topics that are top of mind uh, for us here at, uh, at Fifth Wall. We talked about some of them uh, on panels here today and I wanna get your hot take on it um, from kind of where, where you guys uh, sit. Um, and this is, I'll prompt a couple of you guys, but, but just feel free to chime in. Um, the first topic is uh, solar in commercial real estate. We spent a lot of time at Faith Wall, I know Peter is here, uh, thinking a lot about uh, that topic and potentially trying to unlock uh, that area for some of our uh, CRE players. Um, I'll start with you, Anthony, then maybe Jeff. I know you guys both spend time thinking about solar in commercial real estate. Sure, so, so if I'll start on that, I think solar is underrated. The, the, I don't think anybody denies that there's an opportunity there. From, from an investment standpoint, there's an opportunity to monetize and there's so many different models that we can use. The, the technology and the service providers are starting to catch up with that. But ultimately, anybody who's, all four of us probably recognize that it's not as simple as just snap your fingers and throw some solar up. You're looking at the age of your roof, you're looking at the structural components, you're looking at the, the regulatory environment. Can you sell it to your tenant? Can you not sell it to your tenant? Do you get the green, the, the green credits? There's, uh, there's so many more variables than just spending some money and putting it on the roof. If, if, it, if that's all it was, I'd have solar on every building. Yeah, I agree there's these challenges on every building. At the same time, I think we're in a market where in the future, power, price of power is only gonna go up. Like demand is far outstripping supply with electrification. And so anytime you can be long solar and also potentially provide another revenue stream for your business, I think it's a great opportunity. And I think with things like battery energy density going up, grid parity, it's nearing grid parity to have storage on your buildings. So that enables things like virtual power plants, which has come up in a couple of the other panels today. I think that's a very exciting opportunity for, for every landlord to get involved um, and actually generate the power you need on your building while also excuse me, generating a, a potential revenue stream as well. Modular and prefab construction. Um, I differentiate it because modular construction is something different than construction with modules. And understanding this difference um, actually helps us to use modular construction the right way. Yeah, and I'll say it's generally underrated, um, particularly I feel there's a lot of downtime at a job site, whether just looking at an individual day and even in the night. So through a combination of both skilled labor, uh, new alternative construction methods, and then even some automation, I think we can significantly increase construction efficiency going forward. EV charging, we talked about this a little bit today. Overrated, underrated, and why? Yeah, Jason exactly. and Anthony. I'll go first. Um, I think it's generally underrated, sorry. <laughs> uh, but um, from my perspective, I think it's just gonna be a baseline for landlords in the, in the long run. If you're not offering it, you're gonna just lose competitiveness. I think it's underrated right now in most asset classes. Nobody's, uh, let me rephrase that. The, the demand for charging at the office or charging while you're at the mall, I, I think most people that have EVs right now are charging at home. And so it's going to grow in the multifamily sector. In the, the spaces that we're in, we're not seeing the demand there to, to really push the needle on it. Um, but I really, to, to some of the earlier panels where we talked about the infrastructure, the greater infrastructure, that's a real big issue. Okay, so unfortunately we're up on time. If you wanna get the answer to generative AI and uh, our panelists' view on it, go grab them in the, in the hallway. Uh, but thank you very much uh, to our panelists. Um, with applause, uh, and then hope you all enjoy the panel and the rest, um, the rest of the conference.